Why, hello there, and welcome to another episode of First Chapter Fridays with Fourth and ISD Librarians. Um, this story today is titled Dragon Pearl by Yoon Ha Lee. Um, this novel is part of the Rick Riordan Presents, uh, a series published by Disney Hyperion that celebrates the mythology of different cultures around the world. Um, if you listened uh, to the first chapter Friday from last week, you heard one of my colleagues, Miss Davis, uh, reading Sal and Gabby Break the Universe, and that is actually from the same series. And while that story has a Cuban influence with the, some of its characters and settings, um, this story has a Korean influence in some of the mythology and uh, cultural aspects of that society. Um, so I'm just going to be reading the first little snippet here as a teaser for all of you. And so um, all you need to know right now is that the main characters live in a futuristic world on a very barren and drab desert planet. Um, and the main character and her family are mystical beings in a sense, because they are fox spirits masquerading as people. So their appearance is human, um, but they are shapeshifters and have some other powers and abilities. Um, that is a pretty central part of the story. All right, so I won't, don't, don't want to give away too much. Let's jump right into Dragon Pearl. I almost missed the stranger's visit that morning. I liked to sleep in, though I didn't get to do it often. Waking up meant waking early. Even on the days I had lessons, my mom and aunties loaded me down with chores to do first. Scrubbing the hydroponics units next to our dome house, scrounging breakfast from our few sad vegetables and making sure they were seasoned well enough to satisfy my four aunties, ensuring that the air filters weren't clogged with the dust that got into everything. I had a pretty dismal life on Jinju. I was counting the days until I turned 15. Just two more years left before I could take the entrance exams for the Thousand World Space Forces and follow my brother, June, into the service. That was all that kept me going. The day the stranger came, though, that day was different. I was curled under my threadbare blanket, stubbornly clinging to sleep, even though light had begun to steal in through the windows already. Then my oldest cousin, Bora's snoring got too loud to ignore. I often wished I had a room of my own, instead of sharing one with three cousins. Especially since Bora snored like a dragon. I kicked her in the side. She grunted, but didn't stir. We all slept on the same shabby quilt, handed down from my ancestors, some of the planet's first settlers. The embroidery had once depicted magpies and flowers, good luck symbols. Most of the threads had come loose over the years, rendering the pictures illegible. When I was younger, I'd ask my mom why she didn't use charm to restore it. She'd given me a stern look, then explain that she'd have to redo it every day as soon as the magic wore off. Objects weren't as susceptible to charm as people were. I'd shut up fast because I didn't want her to add that chore to my daily list. Fortunately, my mom disapproved of charm in general, so the discussion hadn't gone any further. All my life, I'd been cautioned not to show off the fox magic that was our heritage. We lived disguised as humans and rarely used our abilities to shapeshift or charm people. Mom insisted that we behave as proper, civilized gumiho, so we wouldn't get in trouble with our fellow steaders planet-bound residents of Jinju. In the old days, foxes had played tricks like changing into beautiful humans to lure lonely travelers close so they could suck out their life forces. But our family didn't do that. <laughs> the lasting prejudice against us did annoy me, though. Other supernatural beings like dragons and goblins and shamans could wield their magic openly and were even praised for it. Dragons use their weather magic for agriculture and the time-consuming work of terraforming planets. Goblins, with their invisibility caps, could act as secret agents. Their ability to summon food with their magical wands came in handy, too. Shamans were essential for communicating with the ancestors and spirits, of course. We foxes, though, we had never overcome our bad reputation. At least most people thought we were extinct nowadays. I didn't see what the big deal was about using our powers around the house. We rarely had company. Few travelers came to the world of Jinju. According to legend, about 200 years ago, a shaman was supposed to have finished terraforming our planet with the Dragon Pearl, a mystical orb with the ability to create life. But on the way here, both she and the pearl had disappeared. 
I didn't know if anything of that story was true or not. All I knew was that Jinju had remained poor and neglected by the Dragon Council for generations. As I reluctantly let go of sleep that morning, I heard the voice of a stranger in the other room. At first, I thought one of the adults was just watching a hollow show, maybe galactic news from the pearled halls, and had the volume turned up too high. We were always getting reports about raids from the jeweled worlds and the Space Force's heroic efforts to defend us from the Marauders, even if Jinju was too far from the border to really suffer such attacks. But the sound from our hollow unit always came out staticky. No static accompanied this voice. It didn't belong to any of the neighbors either. I knew everyone who lived within an hour's scooter ride of my house. And it wasn't just the unfamiliarity of the voice, deep and smooth, that made me sit up and take notice. No one in our community spoke that formally. Were we in trouble with the authorities? Had someone discovered that fox spirits weren't a myth after all? The stranger's voice triggered my old childhood fears of our getting caught. You must be misinformed. That was my mom talking. She sounded a little tense, like she was trying to stay relaxed. Now I really started to worry. No mistake, the voice was saying. No, no mistake what? Couldn't hear. I had to find out more. I slipped out from under the blanket, freezing in places when Bora grunted and flopped over. I bet starship engines made less racket. But if the stranger had heard Bora's obnoxious noises, he gave no sign of it. I risked just a touch of charm to make myself plainer, drabber, harder to see. Foxes can smell each other's magic. One of my aunties described the sensation as being like a sneeze that won't come out but my mom might be distracted enough not to notice. How is this possible? I heard mom ask. My hackles rose. She was clearly distressed, and I'd never known her to show weakness in front of strangers. I tiptoed out of the bedroom and poked my head around the corner. There stood mom, small but straight-backed. And then came the second surprise. I bit down on a sneeze. <sighs> mom was using charm, too. Not a lot, just enough to cover the patches in her trousers and the wrinkles in her worn shirt and to restore their color to a richer, more vibrant green. We hadn't expected visitors, especially anybody important. She wouldn't have had time to dress up in the fine clothes she saved for special occasions. It figured she'd made an exception for herself to use fox magic, despite the fact that she chastised me whenever I experimented with it. The stranger loomed over her. I didn't smell any charm on him, but he could have been some other kind of supernatural, I guess, like a tiger or a goblin, in disguise. It was often hard to tell. I sniffed more closely, hoping to catch a whiff of emotion. Was he angry? Frustrated? Did he detect mom's magic at all? But he held himself under such tight control that I couldn't get a reading on him. His clothes, finely tailored in a burnished bronze-colored fabric, were all real. What caught my eye was the badge on the breast of his coat. It marked him as an official investigator of the Thousand Worlds, the League to which Jinju belonged. Now, there weren't literally a thousand planets in the League, but it did encompass many star systems, all answering to the same unified government. I'd never been off-world myself, although I'd often dreamed of it. This man might have visited dozens of worlds for his job, even the government seat at the Pearled Halls, and I envied him for it. But more to the point, what was an investigator doing here? I could only think of one thing. Something had happened to my brother, June. My heart thumped so loudly I was sure he and Mom would hear it. Your son vanished under mysterious circumstances, the investigator was saying. He is currently under suspicion of desertion. I gasped involuntarily. June? Deserting? That's impossible, Mom said vehemently. My son worked very hard to get into the Space Forces. I didn't need my nose to tell me how freaked out she was by this. I remembered the way June's face had lit up when he'd gotten the letter admitting him to the academy. It had meant everything to him. He would never run off after getting what he had trained so hard for. I bit the side of my mouth to keep from blurting that out. The investigator's eyes narrowed. Hmph, <laughs> that may be, but people change, especially when they are presented with certain opportunities. Opportunities? Mom swallowed and then asked in a small voice, Whatever do you mean? Well, according to his captain's report, 
your son left to go in search of the dragon pearl. I wasn't sure what stunned me more, the idea of June leaving the Space Forces or the fact that the dragon pearl might actually exist. The pearl? H how? My mother asked incredulously. No one knows where... The Dragon Council has made strides in locating it, the investigator said, rudely cutting her off, and they would pay handsomely to have it back in their possession. If he found it, your son could have found the temptation irresistible. <sighs> no, I knew my brother wouldn't risk his career by trying to cash in on an artifact, even one so renowned as the Dragon Pearl. Mom's shoulders slumped. I wanted to tell her not to believe the investigator so readily. There had to be some other explanation. Well, June is not here, she said, drawing herself up again, and we have not heard from him either. I'm afraid we can't help you. The man was not put off. There is one matter you can assist us with, he said. Your son's last report before he left. It included a message addressed to Min. I believe that's your daughter. A shock went through me when he said my name. I have been sent here to show it to her. It may offer clues to June's location or to the pearls. Perhaps he wrote it in a code language only she would understand. Again, I think you have the wrong impression of my son, Mom said haughtily. He is an honorable soldier, not a traitor. So you say, but I am not leaving these premises until I have shown Min the message. Are you not curious to see his last communication? That did the trick. Min! Mom called. I ducked back around the corner before she could spot me, waited a couple moments, then walked out to greet them both. My nose tickled again, and I stifled a sneeze. <sighs> yes, Mom? I asked, pretending I hadn't been eavesdropping on their conversation just now. <laughs> Mom briefly explained the situation to me. This man has a message from June, she said. He'd like you to tell him if you see anything unusual in it. I could hear the skepticism in her voice. I nodded sullenly at the investigator, resenting the fact that he had accused my brother of deserting. Still, there was a silver lining. The man did seem unaware that we were fox spirits. Please, let me see the message, I said, remembering to speak politely and formally. The investigator looked down at me. If I had been in fox shape, my ears would have been flattened against my skull. His expression wasn't condescending, as I would have expected. Instead, I could sense him measuring me, and now I could smell some suspicion coming off him. Did he think I was hiding something? He drew a data slate out of a pocket, tapped on it, and showed me a message marked with June's seal. Nothing fancy, just his name done in simple, simple calligraphy. I scowled at the fact that they'd been snooping into my brother's private messages, but there was nothing I could do about it now. The letter said, Hello, men. Don't tell Bora, but there are even more chores on a battle cruiser than there are at home. I can't wait until my first leave. I have so many things to tell you. I've made lots of friends. Together we've been exploring a new world, just like Dad. My friends help me with the chores sometimes, too. Did I mention the chores? Love, your brother, June. I blinked rapidly. I wasn't going to cry, not in front of this stranger. I handed the slate to Mom so she could read it, too. June's letters to us had been few and far between. The Thousand Worlds lacked faster-than-light communication technology, so all interstellar messages had to be delivered by courier. I couldn't bear the idea that this might be the last we ever heard from my brother. This investigator had to be wrong. Still, the message's contents gave me hope. There was a hidden meaning in there, all right. June had never complained about chores the whole time we were growing up. He was trying to tell me that something was wrong, maybe? And who were the friends? Were they really friends or troublemakers he'd fallen in with? Why hadn't he included anybody's name? The most worrying clue was this mention of dad. For one thing, our dad had died seven years ago when I was six. And for another, he had never been an explorer. According to mom, he'd been a simple but at least skilled technician. What was June trying to imply? How much of this did I want to reveal to the investigator, though? I didn't trust this man. After all, I didn't know anything about him or his motives. On the other hand, I couldn't thwart him too obviously. That might just get my family in trouble. And if he decided to investigate us further, our secret that we were all of us fox spirits 
might be exposed. I had to be careful. I'd hesitated too long. Min, the investigator said in a disturbingly quiet voice. Can you tell me anything about this? He's just complaining, I said, doing my best not to sound grudging or concerned. His gaze captured mine. That's not the whole story, though, is it? I wasn't going to rat June out to some stranger. I don't know what you mean. I could smell an extra whiff of worry from Mom. She wanted me to do something in response, but what? Many powerful people are interested in the Dragon Pearl, the investigator said, as if I couldn't have already guessed that myself. If it has resurfaced, it is imperative that it be recovered by the Space Forces and not by some unscrupulous person. I understood why that was important. According to legend, the pearl could transform an entire planet in a day. Dragons control terraforming magic, but they were not nearly that fast and efficient. It usually took years for teams of trained workers to make a world fully lush and hospitable. As a citizen of Jinju, I was especially aware of that fact. June was too. With a sinking feeling, I remembered why June had wanted to go into the Space Forces in the first place. I want to learn how to help Jinju no matter what, to make life better for everyone here. He had told me that more than once. He wouldn't have stolen the pearl for our benefit, would he? Surely not. And that is the conclusion of our reading today, just to show you kind of the beginning setting and a bit of the conflict of Dragon Pearl. So if you're interested, pick up this book and the other mythological tales from the Rick Riordan's Presents series. And we'll be back uh, next Friday with another rendition of First Chapter Fridays with FBISD librarians. Happy reading to all of you, and I hope you're staying safe and well at home. Have a wonderful day.